So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. I'm very nice to see so many, so many people signing up. Uh, my name is Catherine Simondi. I'm in charge of marketing and communication at ID Quantic. Um, so, we're going to have this webinar given by Bruno Hattner, which is called Developing Your Quantum Safe Communication Expertise. Uh, this webinar is going to be recorded, and I just want to add that you can ask questions. Uh, at the bottom of the bar, you probably see a QA. Um, section where you can put your question and we will answer to as many as, as we can at the end of this webinar. So our speaker today is Bruno Hattner. Uh, Bruno joined IDQ about 10 years ago, uh, participating in business development and product management roles. He is director of strategic quantum initiatives and a quantum uh, key distribution expert. He is also co-chairman of the Quantum Safe Security Working Group organized by the Cloud Security Alliance. So Bruno, the floor is yours. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, uh, all of you, to participate uh, today. Uh, let me start, of course, by sharing my screen. Here we go. So let me see. Yeah. OK. So the idea today is this webinar is really about you, about helping you to develop your quantum safe communication expertise. And I want to teach or to at least explain to you um, the situation of uh, quantum today and why we need quantum safe and so on and so forth. The seminar will be about half an hour, I hope. And then we'll have some questions which you can, as Catherine said, you can put in the chat box below. The agenda is about first the quantum computer. Um, I will spend some time explaining you a little bit more than we normally do about qubits, because I think it's important to understand why is there such a big difference between the usual bits we're working on, we're working with, and the qubits. And then we'll see why is it a threat to cybersecurity. Second part is about the solution. If there is a threat, what we want is to find a way to get back to cybersecurity, and the solution is known as quantum safe crypto. I will discuss three basic tools to get towards quantum safe again. Quantum key generation, quantum resistant algorithm, or known as a post quantum crypto, and quantum key distribution, which is really what most of the thing we are doing at ID Quantic. I will make a little, this a little bit more precise by discussing some QKD implementations and then provide you with a quick conclusion. Since the subject is very, very vast, of course, we wouldn't have time to discuss everything. So again, I encourage you to come back to us if you've got questions, if you want to know more, uh, maybe if you need other webinars, we'll be happy to discuss with you. So let's start with the quantum computer. Computation is actually a physical process. In your computer, what's happening is that you will have uh, uh, bits which are represented by something physical. It can be a capacitor, a charge on a capacitor, an electric current, a voltage. All of that is possible, but really at the bottom, it is a physical process. However, we've been very lucky that we can abstract this physical process and go to a purely mathematical layer. So computation now is really playing with bits, zeros and one, and knowing how to make, how to compute with this. We don't really need to know about the structure, the physical structure underlying our computers. When you now go to a quantum computer, the basic, what's happening is that the bits are replaced by so-called qubit, quantum bits, and these quantum bits are very, very different from the usual bits you are normally playing with. Of course, once you know the quantum bit, your qubits, you can also recover an abstract mathematical layer. You can play with these qubits. However, the logic, the structure of the mathematics of these qubits is very, very different from what we are used to with the classical computer. And that's what makes all the difference between classical and quantum. The rules, how you play with your qubits are very different from the rules where you play with your bits. Let's try and make it a little bit more precise. A classical bit or a classical, in a classical computer, a bit can be zero and one. 
I represent them here in a double well, and I put a marble in one of the two wells. If it's on the right hand side, it's a one, on the left hand side, it's a zero. On a computer is simply a device which could have many, many of these bits in memories and rules how to move the marble from one to the other. For some of you who know a little bit about this, it's called a Turing machine. And that's all you need to make a classical computer. When you move to quantum, you start with very different building blocks. So building blocks are known as qubits, and these qubits can also be zeros and one, as we have on the classical side, but they can also be in so-called coherent superposition. Here, I try to represent them somehow, and my qubit is a little bit of a zero on the one at the same time. Remember, it's very strange because we still have one marble, but this marble is not in one hole or the other, but a little bit in between. And by doing that, you actually add uh, a very uh, more parameters to what you can do with a qubit because you can build very different coherent superpositions. Here I show you 0 plus 1 and 0 minus 1. I try to represent them in, in some graphical way, but there are many other things you can do. But let's try to go a little bit deeper into that because what does this mean? What is this coherent superposition? This webinar was intended to people who have done a little bit of physics because it's about the research uh, system we are developing at ID Quantic. So I thought you would be interested in knowing more a little bit about what are these uh, very strange coherent superposition. So we go back to a very no, uh, known experiment in physics. It's called Leon slits. And you take, a, let me bring my laser pointer. You take a source and you send particles toward a, two slits, one here and one there. And after the slit, you got a screen. So you send one particle at a time. The particle can go through one screen or to the other. This is exactly the bit you had before. Your system can be either going through one side or to the other one. Now, let's start with closing one of the slits. If you look at the distribution, of course, this is a histogram I sent one particle at a time, and I will build here a histogram. So if I close P1, I only have P2, and the histogram I will get is the red one here. It means that in front of, the P of this slit, I will have the largest number of particles arriving, and then it goes down on both sides like this. If now I close the other one, I open the P1 now, I have the same distribution, of course, it looks very similar, but centered at another place. So P1 will go towards here, P2 will go more towards this. And now let's open my two slits. In classical domain, when you open the two slits, the particle will go one way or another. And therefore, you simply add the two histograms, and that's what we should get when you open the two slits. And that's actually what you get with particles. Okay, that's very simple. But now what's happening when you have coherent superposition? When we deal with single photons, the photon now can be in a coherent superposition of going one way or going with another way. So if now I close one of the slits, you see that I recover exactly the same thing as I had before. The photon will go through one slit at a time. But if now I open the two slits, and then there is this coherent superposition, you see that what we see on my final screen is an interference pattern. Now that looks very strange because here in this point, for example, if I open one of the slits, if I have the photon can go only through one day, one, one way it can be here. If it's the other, it's here. If I now open the two doors, what's happening is suddenly I got less photons. The same here. That's something which you cannot understand classically. You can understand it if you have a wave, but you cannot understand it with a particle. And that's exactly what quantum mechanics is telling you about this coherent superposition. When you have a coherent superposition, you create an interference pattern, and the, the way you sum the possibilities is now completely different. And that's exactly what will happen, actually, with the quantum computer, uh, as we will see in a moment. Right, so now we understand a bit more about coherent superpositions. How can we use that? 
The nice thing is that even with a single qubit, you can already have some very interesting properties. The first property is that by making a coherent superposition of my two qubit, of my qubit in a coherent superposition of zero and one, if now I make a measurement of this, I will get either zero or one, but there is absolutely no way I can tell in advance which way it will go. So I prepare a very precise state. This is something I can prepare precisely. I prepare many of them. Then each time I make a measurement, I can get a zero or a one, and there is absolutely no way I can know what I will get. This is a way to generate randomness. As we all know, and this was just an explanation in terms of my coherent superposition, quantum mechanics is non-deterministic, which means that when you make a measurement, you don't really know which way it will go. And we'll use that in order to generate randomness. It's not so easy to generate randomness. Quantum mechanics is a great way to do it, and it's used everywhere in cryptography. So that's a very useful thing to have. With a single qubit, there is another thing you can do, is to secure communication. And this is known as quantum key distribution. Here, I still have a single qubit, but you see, I can prepare it in three different states. Now, in quantum mechanics, if I have one qubit, something with a two-level system, but I prepare three different states, you cannot make a measurement which will separate them perfectly. There is no way, if I give you this one of the three and, that, and I don't tell you which one it is, there is no way you can find out for sure which one I gave you. So if now I want to send these, and Eve, the eavesdropper, wants to make a measurement, she cannot separate them perfectly, and therefore sometimes she will think it's something and it was something else, she will introduce errors in the transmission. The basic idea between QKD is simply that any attempt at eavesdropping will create errors. Then it's up to us to find out these errors and find out that there was an eavesdropper and do something about it. We will go through that a bit later. But what I wanted to show you is really single qubits can give you already something very interesting. And that's what we are doing at ID Quantic. We are really playing with these single qubits. But of course, you can do much more. And when you start putting many of these qubits, then you can enhance the computing power. It's known as, of course, a quantum computer. The quantum computer is based on entanglement. Entanglement is nothing more than a coherent superposition, but of many qubits, not one, which can be in a superposition of zero and one, but many qubits together, and you build coherent superpositions of these multiple qubits. And what is the result is that a quantum computer will process, can process an exponential number of input states in one step. That's a little bit hard to understand. So let me give you a little bit more so that you have at least a feeling of why this happens. Let me start with a computer. All my qubits, I have here an n qubit here, they are all in the zero state. Remember, I can create this, um, this coherent superposition. So what I do is I perform an operation on my system so that I put a coherent superposition of zero on one here, on the first qubit. OK, so first step, take first qubit, put it in coherent superposition. Second step, take the second qubit and put it also in the coherent superposition. So you see now something interesting is that the, this one goes to a coherent superposition of this and that. This one goes to a coherent superposition of this and that. So that the overall state is now a coherent superposition of all these four states. Now I go to the third qubit, and the fourth qubit, and so on and so forth. And what is really interesting is by uh, acting on n times, n operation, I will now generate a state which is a coherent superposition, not of n state, but two to the power n states. Here, I can make a huge superposition with many, many states. And if I now use this state instead of one of the possible state. But if I use this coherent superposition as an input, when I do a computation, when I want to work on this state, I will simply compute simultaneously on all the possible input states. That's why the quantum computer gives you this huge power, because instead of looking at one at a time, take a state, doc, 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 some, uh, do, do some computation, get a result. Here, you take a huge state, and you go through a computation of all of the possible state together. 
Of course, it's not that simple. Afterwards, you will make a measurement. You will use interference in order to enhance some result with respect to others. We don't have time to go through the details. But what I wanted really to show you is that this idea of coherent superposition is really the basis of the quantum computer and why suddenly you can have something much, much faster than a standard computer. So this quantum computer is great. It will give us, we hope, many new opportunities. I don't have to develop them because you probably have heard about that with all these big companies developing quantum computers to do great stuff. However, we also know that the quantum computer is a threat for cybersecurity. And this is the side which we're interested in today. Of course, we could also discuss the other side, but today let's discuss on the threat side. I call it the dark side of the quantum computer. Why is it a threat? Because a problem which was hard, which is factoring, suddenly becomes easy with a quantum computer. Factoring is, is very easy to understand. I give you a large number and tell you it's a product of two primes. If I only give you this, it's very hard to find the primes. However, on the other side, if I give you the primes, it's easy to find uh, the, the product. You can do it with a piece of paper. And why is this relevant? Because this factoring product versus factoring is at the heart of all our public key cryptography. All our cybersecurity depends on the hardness of this problem. So quantum computer, through Shor's algorithm, manages to change this hard problem into an easy problem. And therefore, we can now factorize as easily as we can make a multiplication, provided we have a quantum computer. So don't believe that this is something small. Before the quantum computer, this is the status of our cybersecurity. Of course, we have hackers. We have people who are trying to enter our castle and destroy it. But whenever it, a hacker would do that, you can try to plug the hole to make sure you find a solution to uh, close this window and so on and so forth. Once you have a quantum computer, everything is destroyed. So basic crypto, which is behind our cybersecurity, does not exist anymore. Therefore, we need to find new solutions. These new solutions are known as quantum safe crypto. So what are the tools we have? What kind of tools can we obtain which will remain secure when we have a quantum computer? We have five basic tools, and you can group them in two different categories. One of the categories is using quantum. As I showed you before, there are things that quantum can do which you cannot do classically. And of course, you remember this was a quantum key, a key generation with a quantum random number, which we discussed before. And we have another quantum thing which we can do is quantum key distribution for doing key exchange mechanism for cryptography. So these two obviously will remain secure when we have a quantum computer. You can also look at some of the mathematical problems we had before, which are still OK, like symmetric crypto is not, a, a, is not destroyed by the quantum computer. You need to double the size of the keys, as probably most of you know. But that's the only thing. And this is easy to do. There is another kind of tools which you can get is this hash-based function, which you use everywhere for authentication, signature, and so on. And this, again, by doubling the size, it remains safe. And then we have this post-quantum algorithm, which are classical algorithm, which will replace the one which are destroyed by the quantum computer. Of course, we hope that this will resist the quantum computer. They are designed for that. And we will go through that in a moment. So you see that beforehand, beforehand we had our nice uh, mathematical algorithms we could work with to obtain cybersecurity. Now we have a new cryptographic toolbox, which we can use. And we will have to apply different things, different uh, of these tools to obtain different functions. There have been some antagonism between physics and math uh, in this respect beforehand. And I think this is wrong. Basically, today, we now acknowledge that what you need is a mixture of all these solutions. You have a set of tools. Use the one you need, which is the best for the practical thing you have to do. So if you need, for example, a crypto function, what you need is to generate randomness, generate uh, get randomness, basically it's called entropy generation, then the best solution clearly is quantum. Because quantum mechanics is non-deterministic, non it is rather easy 
to create randomness. Another crypto function which is very useful is authentication on signature. And here, you can use mainly mathematics for quantum crypto. We hope to have, we have already the hash based function on some others which can be used to uh, achieve authentication on signature in a secure way. You can also use some physical stuff actually. It's called physically unclonable function. So you devise a, a little uh, chip or something small which you can put somewhere which nobody can duplicate and that can give you also authentication. So, so you see, you can use both maths and physics. Another thing you need in cryptography is how to exchange keys, especially in symmetric crypto. And here again, you have two solutions. You can use math with post-quantum crypto, and you can use quantum with quantum key distribution. Finally, when you want to encrypt data, the, here the problem is you need really to do it very, very fast. Here, today, the only solution is to use math. So you see that depending on the function you need to use, you need to, add, to, to, to use, you will rely on different solutions. You will sometimes use quantum, sometimes use classical, mix everything, and try and get the best security. Unfortunately, today, you need to understand both worlds in order to be able to give a really good solution. So let's go a little bit, very briefly, into the tools. Quantum key generation. As we discussed before, to generate randomness, it's very easy to use quantum. Here, my Coherent superposition is a photon going either up or straight on my semi-transparent mirror. So I create my photon in a coherent superposition. Now you know what this is. And when I make a measurement, I got one or the other, and the result is totally random. So that's a really good way to generate randomness. Today, we are not using exactly this solution. We make it much smaller. We still use the properties of light uh, to, uh, to generate randomness. But at ID Quantic, we managed to put all that in a very small chip, which you can now integrate into basically everything, into a PC, into a phone, into a server, into IoT. So this kind of chip can be very useful to generate randomness. Second tool is quantum resistant algorithms. This is a purely classical tool. There is no quantum. It's a new algorithm. Uh, based on a problem which we believe will be resistant to the quantum computer. Again, we thought that factoring was good. It was good against the classical computer, but it's no good against the quantum. So we need to find something else. And that's really what the NIST in the US has been doing for the last eight years now. And uh, they wanted to find and to standardize the new algorithm which will resist the quantum computer. You probably all know about of this process, so let me be brief. We have now reached a final stage, if you want. So NIST has already selected four different algorithms for uh, key exchange and signature. And these algorithms are in the process of being standardized right now. It's, uh, they're writing the final specifications. Very soon, you will be able to use this uh, algorithm. However, they were not totally happy because you see, when you look at it, most of these uh, algorithms are based on similar mathematical problem. So there is a risk. If this problem is broken, all of that would be broken. Therefore, they are now looking in more details about other problems as well, which were discussed before, but they are trying to increase the number of standard algorithms which people will be able to use. Okay, it's called the, the NIST round four, and there are things on the investigation for key exchange, and there is even another one also for signatures. So we believe we have found good algorithm, but there are still a little bit of question mark, if you want. So the reason there are still this risk is that, you know, this post-quantum algorithm can have classical risk. Can you break them with a classical computer? Many of, uh, I mean, the, the systems we used before were, were very well known, and we expected that there was no classical risk. The new problems, the new mathematical problem we are using today are not so well studied, and therefore there is still a risk. And actually, it's not that there is a possible risk. Some of the algorithms which were selected initially have been totally broken classically. Okay, it's, one was called Rainbow, the other one is Psych. Both of them are now known to be uh, totally, uh, non cannot be used at all because they are broken by a classical computer. 
And then on top of this classical risk, there is a quantum risk. And here I think it's probably very relevant to think about that today. Because today we don't have a fully, uh, a strong enough, if you want, quantum computer. So we don't really, not many people are working on algorithms, on quantum algorithm, which will break whatever, which will break whatever problem is chosen. So by the time we have a full-fledged quantum computer, there will be many, many people who will be working on that, and probably they will find new ways of using this uh, computer, quantum computer, and maybe they will be able to destroy one of these, uh, some of these algorithms. So there is a risk, basically, with this post-quantum algorithm, which is why you cannot rely entirely on this, or better, you need to try and mix things in order to have the best possible solution. And that's why we advise to add quantum key distribution to your system whenever possible, which will add an extra layer, a very different layer of security. The principle of QKD is uh, very well known. QKD is really a way to send a secret key from one point to the other. And the um, scenario is really related to symmetric crypto. So you have a message, you encrypt it with a key. When you send it, the scramble message cannot be uh, found out. The, the eavesdropper cannot find out what was inside because she doesn't have the key. And the only problem for this symmetric crypto is how do you bring the key from Alice to Bob? You could use a trusted courier, people bringing things. It's not very scalable. Of course, you can use public key cryptography with the new algorithm, but there is some, still some unknowns. Or you can use quantum key distribution. Quantum key distribution is simply a way that you, you create a key which is secret between Alice and Bob, and you send, you send particles, quantum particles, through a quantum channel. You remember that if Eve is trying to find out what is the state, she will introduce errors. That's exactly what will happen here. If she will introduce errors, Alice and Bob will find out later by talking to one another, and they will discover that Eve was there. So by using a quantum channel, by sending these qubits, as I've explained before, you can actually find out if there was an eavesdropper or if there is no eavesdropper on what you can do. Let's make it a little bit more precise. Here, we, I put the, what, 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 uh, what is known here as a quantum bit error rate, QBAR, is basically the error rate between Alice and Bob, which Alice and Bob will find out later. What I told you is that if the eavesdropper is trying to eavesdrop on what's going on, she will introduce errors. So there will be a given number of errors. And of course, the more errors, the more information she wants to get, the more errors she will create. Okay? So for example, if she gets a little bit of information here, she will create some errors here. And the, the, the game is really for Eve to find the best strategy, the one which goes as high as possible okay, with respect to the error rate. She wants to get as much information as possible and create as little errors as possible. And basically, all the quantum mechanics behind QKD is really to get this curve, to find out how much Eve can obtain on the key and how much errors she creates. Because once you know this curve, and this is really what all these people uh, trying to uh, get calculating this uh, security proof, basically, are doing. Finding the optimal strategy for Eve, information as a function of the bit error rate. So if on the same graph, I now put the information shared by Alice and Bob, this is very easy because if you have, er if you have no errors, they have a perfect information. And this curve is really, very well known from classical information theory. So there is nothing new here. And you see that in a given range up to this point here in my graph, Alice and Bob know more than Eve. And the difference between what they know and what Eve knows is basically will be, you, will be the key rate, the secret key they can extract in the best possible uh, way from this system. So you see, what I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that because I think it's very important to see that it's not only we know roughly what's happening, we know precisely what is the best strategy. We know exactly with this strategy what would happen. And we know, as a function of the bit error rate, how much key we can extract. That's why we, we say that quantum key distribution has a proof of security, because we really know this curve. There is nothing more the if dropper can do. How do we implement that? That's the theory. As you know, 
there is a little bit of a difference between theory and experiment. And by the way, this picture here, this uh, person which many of you probably know is Gilles Brassard, one of the inventors of QKD. He came to one of, to one of our winter schools we organized uh, many years, several, several times uh, before COVID. We have stopped, unfortunately, since COVID. And uh, we took this picture and that I think is quite interesting. Anyway, this is Gilles. So, it's how, rather, we know that in theory, we have, we have uh, secure kit. In practice, it's a little bit more difficult, but at ID Quantic, we've done that for many years, and we can present here the fourth generation of our QKD system. I'm not going to be able to discuss that too much because of the time, maybe another webinar at some stage, but really what I wanted here to show is that today, QKD is not science fiction or something difficult. QKD is a device which you can put everywhere, and can be used to exchange keys. So you put Alice on one side, Bob on the other side, and the system does everything you need in order to exchange these secure keys and can be used in banking, uh, data centers, government, and so on and so forth. What is also interesting for you is that we have a specific system, which we call the XGR, R being for research, which is a non-protective system, obviously, the system we want to use in the real world will be protected. You cannot do anything to it because then the key will be uh, known. Here, the XGR is very similar, but you can play with it. You can do many things you cannot do with the other. It's really designed for you to learn about quantum key distribution. So if you are interested, you should go back to us and we will explain, of course, in more details. You can get to the parameters. You can change them. You can get what is called the raw key, the key before processing. You can get the key after processing. You can really try to understand how this can work, how you could implement it. And once you are familiar with that, then you can also go to the uh, XG system and implement it in the real world. And that's what we've done, actually. So the, mo the first application of QKD was for single links a data center connected to a backup uh, data center, for example, and you will exchange keys through this quantum channel. So here we would have a QKD system, and these keys will be used in so-called link encryptors, which will already have some level of security, and you will add our keys to improve the security on the whole system. So that was really the first application, point to point, for QKD. However, it's not enough, so afterwards we moved to quantum key distribution networks. And I'm not going to discuss that again. I just give you one example of a network we did in Korea. So we have many, many of these links put together. And of course, what is complicated is to make all these devices to work together to generate keys, which will be able to be used from end to end. And here really uh, in Korea, they wanted to link different government offices and so on with very secure key. So we built an infrastructure, we built all these links, we built a key management system which will allow us to play with these keys if you want from all the users. And we have so-called QKD networks. There are many others now in the world. Of course, you know the one in China, you know probably the one in Europe, which they are building what is called the uh, quantum critical infrastructure with QKD. Many people are working on that. We know in Singapore they are working on that. Even in the US today, they are working on QKD networks. But that's not the end of the game. QKD networks is a way to generate keys and then send them from end to end using what is called trusted nodes. Because in these nodes, between these links, you still need to have security because the keys will appear in the open in these nodes. So the next step, and we hope to reach that soon, is to go to a quantum network. In a quantum network, you don't measure the qubits uh, in transit, if you want. In QKD, you create a qubit and you measure it, and then you create another qubit and you measure it, and so on and so forth. In a quantum network, you will generate a qubit and manage to find a way to bring it from one side to the other. You will use entanglement. It's much more complex, but we are working on that. There will be quantum memories and measurement of uh, Bell measurement, it's called using entanglement. But the end result of this will be that you can create a qubit here and somehow bring it to the other side. And then you can start having 
a QKD network, but with total security for end-to-end. -end. And of course, you will also have other ways of using this uh, very nice quantum network. As you know, a worldwide quantum network is known as a quantum internet. So the quantum internet will probably link quantum computers and so on. Basically, it's a way to exchange qubits from one place to another without limitation of distance and time. Well, I think that's about what I wanted to say today. So let's go to my conclusion. The first thing, it's about you. If you want to join us in this uh, quantum era, you should start to learn about quantum. Of course, while my webinar was a very tiny, tiny uh, in, uh, introduction to that. But by all means, feel free to join. And I think there will be jobs for you, actually, <laughs> in this field today. Second thing is be aware of timing. Things are happening faster than we expected. So quantum computer is here. It's not powerful enough to break what we've done, but it's already here. And we really need to start thinking very, very seriously of how are we going to address the quantum threat. And in order to address the quantum threat, you need to know about all the tools. Don't focus only on one of them. Make sure that you understand all the possibilities and that when you need one, you select the right one. Since everything is still a little bit blurred, you need to pursue cryptographic agility, cryptographic flexibility, if you want. You should never choose a solution which you cannot change later. So know the tools, but also know how to modify them if you, if you have to. And lastly, make sure that you remember how to implement this quantum and classical solution. As I tried to explain to you, today, the safest way to get back to cybersecurity is not to rely on one or the other, but to mix everything and to apply the right tool to the right function. And with that, I thank you for your participation. And I think we can still take some questions. Indeed, Patrick. thank you very much, uh, Bruno. So we do have quite a lot of questions. So we'll answer a few, and then uh, Bruno will reply uh, directly to the people who've, on, uh, who've written the questions uh, in the chat if we can't take them all. So I suggest to take the first one, uh, one of the first, let's say. Um, Bruno, um, a question from Luigi. Could you elaborate on when it's better to use math or quantum for authentication, please? Is so, that yeah, that's a very good question. As I explained, actually, authentication is really best done with math for the moment. Uh, quantum, uh, quantum key distribution does not solve the authentication problem. Quantum key distribution, I didn't have time to explain the details, but relies on authentication. Alice and Bob need to know one another, and then they can obtain uh, six, uh, confidentiality. They can exchange these secure keys. So you, we need some kind of authentication, which is normally done by mathematics. Another alternative, as I discussed briefly, is this uh, physically unclonable functions, these little chips which you could put somewhere, which would be a kind of unclonable tag, which you put in your PC, and therefore everybody will know that it's if with the right uh, tools afterwards, that something is coming from your PC and not from somebody else. But as I explained, the best tool today for authentication is mathematics. And I personally um, really like the hash base functions because the mathematics are rather simple and we know that there cannot be any attack, a uh, new attack mathematically on these functions. So I would really advise, if possible, to use these hash base functions. They have some limitation. If not, you might uh, go to this post quantum. Uh, authentication, which is already, uh, which can be used because uh, they're really standardizing them right now. Okay, thank you. A uh, second question around quantum channel. So given that the quantum channel is not a regular network connection, what are the physical requirements to establish one to connect two data centers? Can you explain? So a quantum channel actually is not so complicated. It is uh, just a single uh, optical fiber. It has some uh, limitation in distance. You cannot go longer today with commercial systems. You go about to 100 kilometers. Uh, uh, academic, in academia, they have gone to three or 400, but let's say there is a limitation. Uh, so you need a physical uh, 
uh, channel. This physical channel is most of the time an optical fiber, and you cannot amplify it. Otherwise, you use standard fibers. You don't need to put new fibers into, into the ground. Actually, the Chinese did because they wanted to have the best possible, lowest possible loss. But you can also use the existing infrastructure. You just need to keep one fiber for your quantum channel. And I need to add that on top of the quantum channel, you need the so-called dis discussion channel between Alice and Bob, which can be uh, one channel in the fiber in another fiber. But uh, you can use the existing infrastructure with a specific uh, dark fiber for quantum channel. Thank you. Uh, a question around standardization. Uh, is there any standardization for QKD implementation for quantum resist resistant crypto? OK, so th there are two different aspects <laughs> here. Yeah. Of course, in post-quantum crypto, as I explained, the standardization is in full speed. You will have uh, algorithms which were standardized, which will be described, and people can use them probably early next year. That's one thing. In QKD, we started a bit later, so we don't have yet uh, full standardization. But I recommend you go to the ETSI, European Telecommunication Standard Institute, and they have just put out a way, actually, a standard for QKD. It's a kind of standard for QKD, which you can have a look at. So I don't want to go into details. Feel free to reach out to us, and we will explain more about this. Another question is around the distance limitation. Is there any way to counter the distance limitation for QKD devices? Yes, there is one way. The first one is to go to space. So if you use satellite and you exchange keys through space, the loss is much less than through a fiber, and therefore you can then reach much, much longer distance. And it will be possible by satellite to have basically a worldwide quantum key, distribu quantum key exchange using satellite. So that's one way. The other solution in order to get rid of this distance limitation is to build so-called quantum repeaters. Um, unfortunately, we don't have them yet. People are working on that. A quantum repeater is really a way to transfer a qubit uh, one, from one point to the other, uh, basically endlessly. But for these quantum repeaters, we need to develop a little bit more of the technology. By mm -hmm. the way, this technology for the quantum repeater is rather similar to what we need for the quantum computer. So the hope is that by developing the right tools in the quantum computer, you will get the quantum repeater free, basically, free of charge with a quantum computer somehow. OK, I, see, I think we'll take a last question, which I like. Um, and then I suggest that we answer to the others, uh, to the people who, who have written. Um, are the QKD networks in different countries compatible with one another? Uh -huh. <laughs> OK, so we are, we are already uh, basically putting a QKD network worldwide. I think it's a great, uh, <laughs> great result from the webinar. So. Um, I think the most interesting example of that is uh, not a network which is ready already here, but it's a planned network. It's a European uh, quantum uh, critical infrastructure network. It starts as a national network. So many countries in Europe are building their own national QKD network, and then they will connect them. And the way you connect them, you need a kind of over uh, a body which is over, overseeing the whole stuff, and it's called the key management system. So you will need one single key management system, but you can work with different QKD systems below this key management system. So you can really build your own QKD network in your area, and then you can try to make it interact with others. Of course, in order to do that, you will need a single key management system. OK, thank you very much. I think we'll stop here. We've been a bit over the time. Um, I just want to thank you all for being here. We will reply to all the questions, as, as I said. And you will also get the recording uh, via email, probably beginning of next week. Um, so thank you very much uh, for attending this webinar and keep posted for other webinars in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.